how did this all start for Linus Hughes, man? I, I've been wanting to get your story for so long. You, you, the floor is yours. There you go, man. <laughs> well, it started off um, when we were playing uh, in the local bands around Buffalo area. You know, um, we worked with a group called The Cause. Levi Ruffin was the leader of that band. And him and Rick James were very good friends. They grew up. And uh, Rick used to come to some of our shows when he was in coming through Buffalo, New York from Toronto. And uh, he got a record deal. And he put out a single called Get Up and Dance. And This was locally around Buffalo? Yes, okay. around Buffalo, New York. We was doing like the, you know, the bar circuits around okay. town. And he used to come to the shows and we were the backup, backup band for him when he was performing his single, Get Up and Dance. And his record jumped off, and he got a record deal through Motown Records. Uh, he decided to pick his band because he needed a band at the time. He decided to pick his band from singly from Buffalo, New York. He got with Levi Ruffin and his wife. They were the first members. And from there, he asked Levi to find the rest of the band for him, you know, the rest of the players. And Levi pulled me in because I used to be the drummer with Levi's band at that time. And from there, we got uh, Oscar Austin. We got uh, Alan Samansky, guitar player, and uh, a guy named Clarence Sims, um, a.k.a. Uh, Ahmed Abdul Ramadan. Okay. <laughs> he was Muslim. And that that basic rhythm section, we rehearsed and became Rick's band. And we went out to California. The rest is history. Man, I've always felt like y'all as an organization has never, has never gotten enough credit. And one thing that I don't like is when I see these funk documentaries, to me, I'm real serious too, man. They're half done because yes. you guys always seem to get left out. And I tell people all the time, mm-hmm. during that Michael Jackson, off the wall era and stuff like that, right. during the Prince Madonna era, for a long time, people forget your organization was number one for a long, long time, time during that surviving that thriller. I mean, that that's, you know, because you're talking about an album that surpassed Saturday Night Fever as the number one selling album of all time. But yeah. the Stone City Band and Rick James were right there. Right. And not only that, the side projects, I thought that he produced on you guys uh, was first-rate material. It wasn't like some people who produce material and they don't allow the artist to wear the material. Ladies Choice in my house and that stuff I mean it was just like first top first rate top of the line stuff man so y'all man you know I'm not trying to to, to, to blow your horn man but y'all y'all were uh, responsible for a lot of big things how, oh, tell me yeah. how, how, how did it get started for you on the drums man that funk man it got started oh, the funk is when I was playing a lot of rock around town and I used a mixture of R&B music uh, and rock my R&B side came from listening to groups like The Moments and Delphonics and Oh, Blue so Magic. you were listening to Yogi Horton on drums yes. and Earl Young and all those Earl guys. Yeah. And, and uh, a special person is Larry James, who used to oh, play wow. for the Delphonics. And then later on, he played behind Blue Magic. He has such a finesse on the drum player. You know, ballet dancer performing, he had finesse. And I wanted to be like that. And I got to a point where, you know, I perfected it to a certain extent. I was on call for a lot of vocal groups around town. And I was performing that. And then I was playing in a rock band. So I kind of mixed the two in. And by the time I met Rick, he caught on to that. He saw the rock side of me and the R&B groove and vocal side. And that's how... My style came about, you know, I used to watch it. That's interesting that you say that because I think a lot of funk musicians do have that side. Most people are kind of like, you know, the R&B stuff, you know, church, gospel, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. But people that are really, 
it's a hardcore funk. Usually you have a rock edge, so that, yes. that's very interesting uh, oh, yeah. that, that you say that, man. I love rock. Now, did you and your brother start playing actually around the same time, or how did that go My about? brother was playing trap drums before me. I started off on just a snare drum. You know, I got the chance to play on that, and I messed around on there. I busted it one day, and my dad, who started us off, he was a, a drummer also, and a okay. guitar player and a sax player. He, he has a jazz background, and I didn't really flow too much with the jazz. <laughs> I wanted to play <laughs> R&B music, you know, like Dyke and the Blazers, and right. Respect by Aretha and all of that. But uh, uh, I was practicing on the drum one day, and I busted the snare drum. And you remember the Quaker Oat boxes? <laughs> <laughs> that was my snare drum. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, Kept on from there, and then I used to watch my brother play. He had a um, a band, and they played like a lot of the schools around town and all the talent shows. And one day he went off to college. I got the drum seat to play in his band, and it went on from there. Now, what kind of kit were you guys using? Were you guys using Ludwig or, or we used a Slingerland drum set? Okay, okay, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, wow. Pearl. Oh, Pearl, okay. Yeah. yeah, right on, man. Mm. Right on. Now, what was the first recording that you actually really officially did with Rick actually around the, the Motown time, like kind of like the late 70s? Which LP was the first one that you actually... Uh, actually, the first recording was a uh, Busting Out album. My favorite. Yeah, That's my favorite, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> that for, for, for different reasons, man. That album has the most different kind of percussive... Latin Afro Cuban funk thing happening yes. of any of those albums, man. That album is 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 a drummer's dream, man. Yes, I, yeah, definitely. I love the like the percussion breakdowns and stuff like on uh, High on Love and and One More Hit and that stuff, man. And mm -hmm. uh, especially when y'all get into the turnaround of Fool on the Street, man. Yes. That that and the flute, man. I'm gone while That's listening it. to that stuff, man. What was the vibe when y'all were in the studio cutting that stuff, man? Uh. Magic, pure magic. We did that Sigma Sounds in New York, right around the corner from Ed Sullivan Theater. You know, we used to, right before we went in the studio, we used to go around the corner and just touch the steps of the Ed Sullivan Theater and say, this is where the Beatles went every time they came on this show. February 1964, I tell people all the time, used to come on CBS, I caught the end yes. of it, like when J5 and them were on, but mm -hmm. uh, I've collected just different tapes over the years and when I think about what happened there I, I can certainly understand why y'all were um, you know kind of like in that man just mm -hmm. yeah that, that I'm glad you say that kind of stuff because I don't like to feel like I'm the only one like you know my attitude is like if I see the right kind of person like like you say want to touch the steps if I see somebody like Quincy Jones I'm ready to start bowing you know so I know <laughs> oh, what yeah. you mean about, I know what you mean about yes. really being in that 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 spiritual zone uh, with the music man Electric Ladyland mm -hmm. and all the just different stuff that Stevie did there before he would start recording at Crystal Man um, what is your favorite out of the um, LPs, as far as the tracks, would you say that you've cut? I mean, I'm sure you like everything, but there's <laughs> anything in particular that you have more fun playing on? Street songs. That's the, the favorite one of them all. Why? You know, if I may ask. That, that was kind of like the Hate album. We had been on the road for about a year, <laughs> and we went straight into the studio to record street songs and the Stone City Band second album, Boys Are Back, we did that back to back. So we was in the studio like about six months straight. And it was like the hate album, it was like the attitude and everything. And it just came out in the recording and it wound up being our biggest album ever. Man, that is uh, something because uh, when I sit back and I regress back on that time. I remember I was living in the projects in San Francisco, and man. No matter where you went, out of everybody's window, boom box or whatever. The only time I had heard an album that was played like that was probably when Doing It to Death that came out. We, we uh -huh. picnics or whatever. But street songs had the same kind of vibe. I mean, from top to bottom, ghetto life. I mean, because that was real for me. That was autobiography, yeah. playing tags with winos. I mean, that was That's real it. for me. That was real. That was a realistic album. Man. What happened really on the streets of Buffalo, New York. 
just wow. the whole vibe. Well, you, San Francisco to film more in Oakland. I mean, I guess mm-hmm. Buffalo to Oakland kind of has hey, the same kind of thing yes. happening, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, but what made made me think of that album being so good, that was the first summer that the Heisley Brothers didn't own. They used to own every summer except that one. Well, I'm going to tell you something, man. Y'all own a lot of summers after that <laughs> because uh, <laughs> that Michael Jackson, Madonna, uh, Prince thing that mm-hmm. was happening that three headed monster y'all kind of was like the Humpty Dance you know please allow me to bump thing okay. y'all came right in was on top of that situation oh, yeah. man. that 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 was, was uh, for th- for those of you who are young it's really kind of hard to explain what we're really really talking about you really would have had to have lived it but mm-hmm. I- I'll tell you this. Not only did y'all have the music on point and on edge, but that, like, it was just about as real as it gets. Yes. About as real as it gets. Natural magic. The vibe. I mean, man, is there a point when you're playing live, like, I hear that live at Long Beach, that CD. Mm -hmm. Um, To me, the way you guys were playing on that, there was like an attitude like, we the baddest band in the world. Yes. Was that the vibe when y'all were on stage? That was the vibe. Rick used to tell us, you know, we're not just going on stage to play. We're going to wear the audience out. If we don't wear the crowd out, we didn't do our job. And that's the attitude we took when we hit the stage. And with Tina, yes. when she came, I, I'm a sucker for you. It seemed like y'all started playing harder. <laughs> I listened to that CD, man. I just kind of like, it's like, how do you take it up another notch? But I tell you, I guess when you start thinking about the players that has come through this organization, you think about cats like Alan McGreer, mm-hmm. played on uh, Sherlin, Shake It Up Tonight, and just all the just the different people that have come through. Jill Jones, who people you guys yes. don't remember from Purple Rain, but was in this camp. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's just amazing. A, a lot of stuff y'all don't get credit for. Right. And, and I really hate watching these half done funk documentaries because that's exactly what they are yes. you guys are always to me thoroughly disrespected and oh, uh, yeah. you guys bill curtis and fat back the soul searchers just different groups man one mm-hmm. way and uh you know i'm here to tell y'all man not only did the Izzy brothers not uh, uh run that summer man but it just seems like Y'all were like on this pedestal that was just like, just, just, just crazy. It's something about the funk that when it gets good like that, it mm-hmm. really gets good. That's it about does. the best way I can. I, I, I just can. keep climbing. And I mean, it seemed like y'all had a heavy influence also on Bobby Brown. That's the vibe that I get. <laughs> Part of the band performed for Bobby Brown. Oh, really? Yes. But see, that was something I didn't know because mm. I know Zorro, the drummer who, pl- you know, mm-hmm. but I had, oh, wow, really? That was really? after Zorro, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, on his uh, Don't Be Cruel tour. Danny LaMelle, the sax player. Oh, wow. He was on there. My brother was the percussionist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not Star making this. I really did. But did you know that um, part of the band was performing on the first beginning of the new edition heartbreak tour oh man and that tour was probably their best ever tour that's when they Mm -hmm. really really became boys to they became men the sound of distinction every wow Mm -hmm. yeah some funk history that i did know you guys y'all had y'all thank y'all hands in a way um to the far left on guitar the light-skinned fellow with the um Long hair and strange looking guitarist, Tom McDermott. <clears throat> Standing behind him is one of the greatest saxophone players around, played with me, Tina Marie, on everybody's album, Mr. Danny LaMelle. <clears throat> on tenor sax with Danny LaMelle, we just call him Chris. <clears throat> no last name. On percussion, uh, from my hometown, Phil I grew up with, that's Nate. Behind him, on drums, his brother, Lannis. Behind him, on drums, his brother, Lannis. On, on keyboards, from our hometown also, Mr. Erskine Williams. On bass.